You are tuned in to your weekly Sunday morning word broadcast, Rhema Power, with Reverend Ni Bernard Adiakwa, Senior Pastor of Powerhouse Ministries International, a program designed to improve your understanding into the Word of God, bring you practical solutions, and empower you to rise above life's daily challenges. Stay tuned. Hello, precious one. We wish to extend a warm invitation to you to join us for any of our Sunday services at the PMI King's Temple. Our services are specially designed to specifically meet your needs and draw you closer to have fellowship with God in His presence. You are welcome to join us in person at 6.15 a.m. for the morning glory service, at 7.30 a.m. for the second service, which is also streamed live across all our social media platforms, and at 9.45 a.m. for the third service. We also wish to invite you to join us for the Living Mana, a weekday Bible teaching service, which comes off every Tuesday at 6 p.m. and Thursday at 6.30 p.m. in person and online, respectively. On Fridays, we gather before our Father's altar at 6 p.m. to pray and seek His face for divine encounters. The King has a special place for you. Don't come alone. You surely will be blessed by the Word of God. In Jesus' name, God richly bless you. In applying the teachings of Jesus, some people will pit His teachings against the other by saying things like, as for me, uh, I focus on the weightier matter of the law, and therefore I don't tithe. Some also argue, as for me, it's not about tithing, oh, it's about having a pure heart. And as for me, it's not about the money I give, it's about loving my neighbor. Listen, these are not against all. Huh? He didn't say because you love your neighbor, don't tithe. He didn't say because you tithe, don't love your neighbor. He didn't say choose which one you want. Of course, we must love our neighbors. But obeying Jesus by loving our neighbors does not excuse us from stealing or from tithing. In the same way, it would be wrong to say, I can do whatever I want. I can commit adultery. I can cheat. I can lie because I pay my tithe. So that's also okay. You don't choose. You don't choose. We must pay attention to the matters of justice, to the matters of mercy and faith as the heart of Christian engagement with our communities. By the same token, we must seek to honor God with the things we have as faithful stewards. Let's look at Jesus' second statement on tithing. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18 from verse 10. And learn a few things from it. Let's all read it together. One, two, go. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as the other men are. Extortionists, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, will not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. 14. I tell you, this man went down to his house, justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Now look at it. Jesus is making three points here. Number one, tithing is not a way to impress God. The parable is about somebody who trusted in himself that he was righteous and he despised other people. And he was actually using his practices of fasting, of tithing to impress God. But that is works. God is not impressed by works. Can you understand that? So he's showing us that this man came to him and said, this is what I do. As for me, I do this. As for me, I don't do that. And he said, hey, stop there, stop there. No. You see, you are doing it legalistically. You are doing it to use it to boast. You are doing it to make you feel superior to other people. You are doing it to impress me. He says, no, you can't impress me. What Jesus is showing us there, the man said, I fast twice in the week. I give tithe of all that I possess. And he says, I'm not an extortioner. As for me, I don't do this. As for me, I don't do that. And Jesus said, hold it. The Pharisee thought that his practice of tithing and fasting would impress God. But those are not things you do to impress God. The second lesson is that tithing must not be done in competition. Hmm. You don't tithe to make you feel you are better than somebody else. The Pharisees measured his spiritual superiority over the tax collector by his tithing and his fasting. He actually called God to observe how better he was than the sinner. Hey! So, you are coming to pray. Hey, as for me, I tithe. As for me, I'm not an extortioner. As for me, I'm not this. Look at that guy. I'm even better than you. And he said, no, that's not the reason why you tithe. To compare yourself. Hey, do you know my tithe? 
And because of that, you feel superior to other people in the church. No. In fact, my personal opinion, that is why I think the tithe is a percentage. So that you can feel superior to another person because if you earn more, you give a percentage. If you earn less, you give a percentage. So whether your percentage in actual terms is 1,000, it doesn't matter because it's all 10%. So before God, we are all equal. So you may earn a lot and come and give a tithe of 10,000. I may earn 10 cities and give a tithe of one city. But before God, all of us are 10%. But that is not a full truth. I'll explain it later. So you don't, hey, ask for me, my tithe, my tithe is heavy. Because God has given the grace to earn a lot. Number three, tithing must not make us arrogant. Jesus ended the parable with this lesson. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. Those who use their generosity to exalt themselves in God's presence will be brought down. So you can clearly see, in none of these do we see Jesus Christ opposed to or suggest that we should not tithe. But rather, he's highlighting the wrong motives and attitudes. And these are the two times in the Bible where Jesus confronted and spoke about tithe. And in both of them, he addressed wrong attitudes. I'm more important because my tithe is heavier. Me, I've gone through that before. And I thank God he's taught me. I'm no more important. We are all saved by the blood. We are all saved and resurrected by his power. We all have the same measure of the Holy Ghost. We are all precious in his sight. So, on the two occasions Jesus Christ addressed the issue of tithing, he focused on the wrong attitudes. This will suggest that the way to fulfill the practice of generosity in the New Testament is to do it with the right attitudes. It must not simply be a legalistic or religious attitude or practice, but a humble expression of devotion to God. You see, when you are bringing an offering before God, don't come with a proud, arrogant attitude that you are better or superior. Come with a grace that God has blessed you and is the source of all our blessings. Not under the law, but we are fulfilling the law properly in Christ. You know, the question I ask myself is, for some of you, assuming there was no law of tithing, what would you do? You wouldn't tithe. You wouldn't. So the law is a schoolmaster. So that at a certain point, you move from under the law into the spirit where you do things to honor God. In church history, the early church fathers saw a difference between what was required under the Old Testament and what Christ required for them. There's a man called Arrhenius of Lyons who was one of the first church fathers and considered one of the first great theologians of the church born around AD 125. This man lived into the second century and he himself was a disciple of another church father called Polycarp, who was raised and discipled by Apostle John himself. So I've shown you Jesus Christ discipled Apostle John. Apostle John discipled Polycarp. And Polycarp discipled Irenaeus. This man, Irenaeus, noted the difference between the Christian view of generosity in relation to the Jewish strict adherence of tithe. And this is what he said about the early Christians and the Jews. He said, and for this reason, the Jews had indeed tithes of their goods consecrated to God, legalistic. But those of us who have received liberty, we set aside all our possessions for the Lord's purpose, bestowing joyfully and freely not the less valuable portion of our property because we have hope of better things hereafter. And he gave the example of the poor widow who cast in everything into the treasury of God and Jesus Christ commended her. The early Christians, those of us who have read the New Testament, gave beyond their tithe. They were willing to give everything to Christ. They used their liberty in Christ as an opportunity to give much more and not less. The early Christians believed that God required more from them than the law did from the Jews. They saw the law of grace as a higher standard than the law of Moses. To them, the devotion unto Christ required more than a tithe. It called for everything we have. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 17, we're going to look at the story of somebody called the rich young ruler. He says, and when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why do you call me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Verse 19, thou knowest the commandments. So Jesus Christ again is referring this young ruler to the Ten Commandments. He's not saying they are thrown away. In the New Testament, somebody comes to Jesus and says, I want to inherit eternal life. Jesus is referring him back to the Old Testament, the Old Commandments, which some people now say it's abolished. This is Jesus, who is the bread of life, telling him, Charlie, go back, the things that he told you, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear four witnesses. Honor thy father and mother. Verse 20, look at what the man said. And he answered and said unto him, Master, 
All these I have observed from my youth. So this man in the New Testament is actually saying, I've done all the things the Ten Commandments tell me. The practice didn't end in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, I'm still doing them. And look at what he said. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, There's one thing you lack. Go thy way. Sell whatever thou hast. Give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. The story of Jesus' encounter with a man who asked about eternal life is found in all the three synoptic gospels. Matthew says the man was young. Luke says he was a ruler. All the three of them, however, agreed that he was rich. But Jesus' conversation is now going to go into the heart of devotion. The man was the one who approached the Lord, asking him, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Being young and rich, it is likely that he had come into wealth through inheritance. And having inherited great wealth, he also wanted to inherit the ultimate eternal life in addition. That would have been a great conquest. Jesus told him what was under the law of Moses. You know the commandments. In other words, obey the commandments. Who said Jesus Christ came to abolish the law? He came to fulfill it. He didn't come to throw it down. He didn't come to say it was over. He actually came because he was saying that I've come to fulfill it. I've come to show you the original intention. I've come to show you the heart behind the law. I've come to show you that it is still relevant, but it's not just a legalistic thing. It is something people do to please God from the heart. Then Jesus went deeper and he told the rich man what was missing in his life. He was now going to expose the true state of his heart. And why this, as a rich young ruler, even though he seems to be pious and seems to be religious and seems to be devoted, there was still a certain part of his life that was void. He still knew that I still don't have eternal life. And so Jesus was going to show him. What did he say? He says, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come up, take up the cross, and follow me. What did the man lack? The man actually lacked total devotion to God. He was still serving God. But he lacked total devotion to God. We can't tell whether this was a test like Abraham's command to offer Isaac or whether Jesus really wanted him to go through with the instructions. We cannot fully tell since the man did not make any attempt to act on what Jesus Christ had instructed him to do. Lest we think that the idea of Jesus asking us to give up was only peculiar to that man. I'm sure you remember when Jesus told Peter and their disciples, there's no man who has left everything who will not in this world gain it. So Jesus himself realized that Peter and the disciples who were following him had left everything. They have left their families. They have left their professions. They have left their businesses. They have left their storehouses. They have left their wealth to come and follow him. And Jesus Christ commended and says, Peter, there's nobody who has left everything who will not in this world receive it a hundredfold and also receive a reward in the life hereafter. So when Jesus is placing the demand on this man to leave everything, that was the same demand he places on his disciples. Jesus actually reveals the reward of giving to his cause. In addition to the earthly reward, there's a heavenly reward and in the age to come, eternal life. And the reward comes with persecution. As a young man growing up, one of the things I kept asking myself, how come every time in the Bible there was an offering or a giving, there was such a great response from heaven? And how come I haven't? being able to get to that point where my giving will provoke heaven. Not just because somebody is telling me to give a seed, but because I've grown into a realization of what pleases God and how to provoke heaven into my life. And I've always come to realize that there are a lot of things I have to work on myself. And that is why in the Old Testament, the priests were not just anybody. The priests were trained because they had to receive offering and present it in a way that was acceptable to God. So heaven will respond to the offerings. Because the attitudes and the motives are important. Jesus Christ is not demanding a percentage from us. In the New Testament, he's actually demanding our lives. He's talking about more than tithe or 10%. He's not dealing with us after 10%. He's dealing with our all. So if in the Old Testament, under a law, it was 10%. In the New Testament, Jesus Christ is fulfilling the law. He's telling us, we are not talking about percentages here. And that is why one of the things that is stressed in the New Testament is giving, not percentages. So if the New Testament is a bit silent on the practice, because the demands are higher, can somebody understand that? And not because it's been abolished. The giving that Jesus Christ is demanding, his demands are superior, his demands are higher to the system under which the Pharisees were operating. The giving that he demands from us is more than what the law demands. The law demands a part of you. 
Jesus demands all of me. What does Jesus demand from you? All. So he's not now asking for 10%. He's asking for all. Even though he didn't condemn the Pharisees and the scribes, he's actually asking for more than that. And you find out when you study the New Testament giving that there are people who gave and they gave. Even in the Old Testament, when God was asking the Israelites to build a tabernacle or an ark, he didn't ask for 10%. You find out that people gave and they gave and they gave beyond the 10% because that's the heart of giving. Let's look at the principles and the lessons we glean from this rich young ruler. Number one, giving is a higher test of godly devotion than our self-declared obedience to the Lord. So when we talk about giving, we are talking about a higher test. The rich young ruler had from a young age been careful and a meticulous adherent to the law. But Jesus Christ realized and recognized that this was not a true test of the man's heart and his love. So he placed a higher demand, give up everything, and the young ruler turned away. Neither money nor works can purchase salvation. But what we do with both our money and works provides evidence of our salvation. You can tell the devotion of a people by their giving. People who argue about giving do not have a giving problem. They argue because there's a major problem with their devotion and worship to God and how far they are willing to go. Jesus identified the one thing that exposed this young man, his total lack of devotion to God. Number two, giving of our abundance is actually a reflection of giving of ourselves. That is why significant giving is hard. Was Jesus Christ selling salvation? No. Was he saying you should give him money so that you have eternal life? No. Instead, Jesus was exposing whether this man's heart truly wanted eternal life more than he wanted earthly things. So he challenged him. Do you really value your eternal life more than you value the things you have? The man wanted eternal life, but he had not counted all things as loss for Christ. Money means comfort. Money means power. Money means security. Money means status. Money means opportunity. Money gives you freedom. Money gives you pleasure and choice. This is why Jesus Christ, when he talks about giving, and he makes a claim on our lives, many people will cringe because it's really a test. And that is why the test of Abraham had to deal with the test of giving. He knows what is each of us and what we value more than him. And this is what he will ask us to be willing to give up in order also for us to receive all that he has for us. For some, the command will be, go and sell all you have. Or for others, it will be, leave your job or leave your career path. And let me use you in ministry. Leave your lifestyle or pursue what I have for you. What will you pay to gain Christ? Paul says, I count all things but dung for the excellency of the knowledge of God. The sad part of this story is not what the man would have lost in following Jesus, but what he stood to gain and yet he never experienced because he didn't obey the commandments of Lord. Let me end by just showing you the standard that Jesus set in conclusion. As Lord and Savior, Jesus wants all of us, every part of us, as we respond to his grace on our lives, this demand will seem small in comparison to what he has done for us. And although scripture is very clear in laying the financial implications of following Jesus, they are actually a comparatively a small part of what he expects from us. It is possible to be like the Pharisees of Jesus, religiously and judiciously tithing, and still keep the weighty parts of the law. We can still somehow honor him, but our hearts will be far from him. And one day he will say to us, like he said to them in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I know you not. I personally believe that a commitment to giving to God must flow genuinely out of a walk with God, not from a desire to impress him or to earn his favor. Instead of the Pharisees counting out their means and thinking they are satisfied God, we should be like the widow with the pens who cast in everything out of gratitude. Tithing is simply a response to God's generosity to us. And if God has been abundant in his blessing to us, then the natural response is for us to be abundant in our tithing. This is the standard Jesus set for us. And it is the standard that motivated the giving practices of the New Testament church. The standards of Jesus are far higher and exceeds the standards of the law and the practice of the Pharisees, etc., who at that time seemed to be the standard bearers of the law. So when we speak about what Jesus is demanding, it is above the Pharisees. It's above the scribes. They sought to live by the exactitude of the law and tithe meticulously. However, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus clearly warns us. Turn your Bible to Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
Look at what Jesus is saying. He says, look at the scribes and the Pharisees. They sit in Moses' law. They bind you with burdens. They themselves are not prepared to lift up a finger. But you must observe and do it. And Jesus is saying that, except your righteousness will be above the righteousness of the scribes. What does it mean? It means we must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees in faith and in love. By first giving our hearts to the Lord and then our whole life. When our hearts are truly surrendered to the Lord, our treasures will also be surrendered to the Lord. For where your treasure is, that is where your heart will also be. The giving of our treasures indicates the location of our hearts. The Pharisees were meticulous about external things. And one of the accusations or denunciations Jesus made about them was that they focused their efforts on external things. They cleaned the outside of the cup, but the inside of the cup was dirty. Let's not just focus on the legalities, the heart. I mean, do you really want to be a giver? Are you really a giver? So if we are starting and under the law, they were giving 10%, isn't 10% a good place to start from? Because our righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees and the scribes. Can you understand that? That is why sometimes say you must give 10%. Because we cannot do lower than what the Pharisees and the scribes and the Old Testament people were doing. Because we are under a better covenant with better promises. So we cannot say that tithing is over. It is over in terms of the legalities. But in terms of the heart, we are prepared to do much more. But we will start because we are under the law as schoolmasters. As people who are under a schoolmaster who are being guided to a point where you grow to honor the Lord with your substance, not with your legalities. So when you understand it, you understand why now some people give and they give and why some like David, when he gives so much, all he can say is that of thine own have we given you. Because we've grown. We're no longer dealing with God as if he's somebody extorting from us. We are giving to him willingly and cheerfully. Matthew chapter 23 verse 24. What does it say? You blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisees, cleanse that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may also be clean. To exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, we must first align our hearts with God. Instead of focusing on the technicalities of income to give to God, we must focus on giving our whole hearts to the Lord. If we commit to do so with all that is within us, we will be able to love him with all that we have. Though salvation in Christ is not based on our works of righteousness, our salvation will definitely produce works of righteousness. So we don't work to please God. But when we are saved, we will produce works of righteousness because our hearts will do things for God. Can you see the difference? One is under the law, we are trying to please God. The other is after we are born again and we are born out of gratitude, out of a deep sense of conviction in our hearts, we produce works of righteousness. I pray that all of us, we shall learn. Biblical stewardship is foundational to understanding why we give to God. Understanding the place of the law and what Jesus Christ himself taught should teach us the attitudes with which we give to God. Go back and search the scriptures. Meditate on it. Believe it. And then do it. Let us not just be hearers only, but may we be doers of the word of God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hello, precious one. We wish to extend a warm invitation to you to join us for any of our Sunday services at the PMI King's Temple. Our services are specially designed to specifically meet your needs and draw you closer to have fellowship with God in His presence. You are welcome to join us in person at 6.15 a.m. for the morning glory service, at 7.30 a.m. for the second service, which is also streamed live across all our social media platforms, and at 9.45 a.m. for the third service. We also wish to invite you to join us for the Living Manna, a weekday Bible teaching service which comes off every Tuesday at 6 p.m. and Thursday at 6.30 p.m. in person and online respectively. On Fridays, we gather before our Father's altar at 6 p.m. to pray and seek His face for divine encounters. The King has a special place for you. Don't come alone. You surely will be blessed by the Word of God. In Jesus' name, God richly bless you.
Thank you for listening to Rhema Power with Reverend Me Bernard Adiakwa. We hope you've been blessed. For further information, contact 0303-931-841. Tune in next week for another insightful teaching on Rhema Power.